Hi, everybody. The theme of this panel discussion today is how well are juniors meeting ESG investment criteria of, of institutional investors. And I'm going to unpack that theme a little bit. I'm going to just start with juniors. What juniors are we talking about? I understand the investment managers and advisors on the panel today are mostly interested in juniors in production, although I understand from Amanda of Arch Emerging Markets Partners, they're interested in projects in development as well. And then on the criteria, well, we all know there's an explosion of governance frameworks, environmental and social governance frameworks. It's overwhelming for the mining industry and their stakeholders. There are too many disclosure standards, too many responsible mining standards and responsible sourcing standards. But fortunately, um, this is recognized and the links between the standards are being studied, the equivalency between standards is being studied. There's a bit of rationalization happening, making everything a bit more manageable. Now in this 40 minute session with four panelists, there's no ways we're going to dig into the detail of all these criteria. We're going to keep up at the level of investors' expectations. And um, I'm interested on the subject of meeting the criteria, whether investors expect mines to be at the end point or just on, on the journey going in the right direction. So I'm going to start by asking each of the panelists to introduce themselves. I think they will introduce themselves better than I will. Um, and I'm asking them to introduce themselves, their firm, their funds, the location, their location, because I'm interested to know if the location influences expectations and also their interest in juniors. And I'm going to start with Amanda van Dijk of um, Arch Emerging Market Partners. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, so Arch Emerging Markets Partners is a, is a private equity advisory firm. We're based in London. Um, we have two other Africa-focused um, uh, funds that we advise on, uh, Renewable Power and Cold Chain Logistics. Um, ours is a new strategy that's just being launched, and we focus on, on sustainable resources. So my me and my team, that's basically what we do. We look for new um, mines or mines that are in development that can get towards um, production in a sustainable fashion or in the most sustainable fashion. Thanks. Um Carl van Alphen of Equinox Partners, if you could introduce yourself and your firm and fund, please. Thanks, Jane. I'm with Equinox Partners, which is a hedge fund based in uh, New York City, well, Stanford, Connecticut at this point. Um, we are, um, we've been investing in the precious metal space for roughly the last 20 years. I am the portfolio manager of the gold fund. Um, and I've been in Equinox for the last two years. Equinox takes a sort of a value approach to investing. And so consequently, we tend to invest mostly in small cap and mid cap um, mining companies. Great, thank you. Matt, if you could introduce yourself and Pacific Road Capital. Terrific, thanks Jane. And just very quickly, thanks for everybody that's listening in. Pleasure to be a part of Minds and Money again. So uh, Pacific Road Capital, we're, uh, we're a mining specialist firm, uh, 15 years in the making. We make very concentrated bets, and we also make growth equity bets as well into mining companies, um, almost all in your space. We're, you know, we can frequently be the only shareholder, the largest shareholder, or a significant shareholder. So what happens with Pacific Road is we're very frequently involved in, uh, in board decisions, and acting like an owner with these companies. And so our framework in looking at the development of responsible investing and the application of ESG really comes with that ownership mentality. Thank you. Joe, um, Joe May of Tri Trium Capital, please introduce. Uh, sure, uh, Trium Capital is based in London. We're a family office and we also have a series of usage funds. I run one of the usage funds. Uh, which is focused on decarbonization and energy transition. As part of that, we're specifically only looking at the hard to abate sectors. So clearly mining is one of those, but also 
obviously transportation, chemicals, um, agriculture, et cetera. Uh, our, our focus tends to be on the mid cap uh, area, uh, not super small, but you know, not the big, big guys either. Uh, we're most interested in companies that can uh, either show the greatest progress toward de uh, decarbonization relative to peers or also help contribute to decarbonization as part of their end markets. Okay, great. Um, Joe, I'm going to start with you. Um, I understand that your fund is in Ireland you're, you're, and um, that's in the EU, which is at the center of sustainable finance ambition. You've got the European Green Deal unfolding. You've got the um, EU Sustainable Finance Action Plan being executed. You've got the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, which is quite a mouthful. I'll call it the Disclosure Regulation in effect. And you also have the Taxonomy Regulation in effect. And I understand those regulations is subsidiary legislation that still has to come in place. Um, so they're still going to evolve further. The requirements are going to evolve further. But I'm interested to know how that influences you and it influences your expectations of the companies you invest in, particularly with respect to mining. Sure. Um, and you're right in that basically we're now at the phase of peak uh, <laughs> peak data and probably peak confusion uh, and peak overload of everyone who has to be in this field and try to actually comply with all these documents. So my, my sympathies to everyone who is in investor relations or sustainability at these companies. But just, to, just in terms of, well, I'll try to give quickly what's important right now to sort of prioritize everyone's effort. Uh, green taxonomy, which you mentioned at this stage in the EU does not have a methodology for mining. So at this stage, you probably have another year before that comes out. Um, uh, the one thing you didn't mention, which is a big thing that you know we focus on, and I'm sure everyone else in this call focuses on, is sustainable development goals, which I would argue mining has a wonderful story to tell. Right now, there's very little standardization in how that's being done across companies. Um, and I don't see, I mean, I see a lot of external providers who are trying to create standardization, but I don't see any methodology yet that can be universally adopted. Um, the, the, mo the point that you mentioned, I think, which, companies, specifically juniors or those trying to raise capital should be aware of is SFDR, Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulations. That is actually a regulation which is on fund managers. It's not actually on companies, but for most, I'd say probably a third to a half of the fund managers in Europe have either signed up as a section eight or section nine, which means they're incorporating ESG and they're, this is for public fund managers, not private, but they're incorporating ESG in their decisions. And that's gonna make basically force them January of next year to release a series of portfolio wide metrics, basically how much um, uh, fossil fuels, how much um, waste, uh, how much um, a portfolio, from a portfolio wide metrics they have in their portfolio. The four topics I would just flag, which we found going through companies that basically no one has, even frankly, the large companies don't provide this disclosure in the way that should. Um, four topics to quickly discuss. One is emissions to water. This is a bit confusing because normally companies are used to disclosing the amount of wastewater or the amount of water used. This is actually the pollutants that go into water. So it's things like cadmium, mercury. They're very specific pollutants on this. The second one is biodiversity. The EU is very focused on this and it's going to be part of the green taxonomy probably in two or three years. Um, and they have a specific number of sites exposed to biodiverse areas. Basically no one, I mean, everyone knows what the answer is, but it's not disclosed right now. Uh, the, the third is um, hazardous waste. Uh, you know, there's been a huge focusing on, on tailings, but I think the EU is trying to basically bring focus now towards specific um, hazardous substances in the waste, not just a total aggregate waste metric. And the fourth is unadjusted pay gap, which unadjusted gender pay gap, which is frankly, most people don't disclose that, but that's also on the list from a portfolio manager that you have to disclose on a portfolio basis. I would imagine for most companies, um, they're going to try to put this out in, you know, the next year's annual report, but just to flag it because portfolio managers will have to start disclosing on this in January. So I'm sure they're all going to come to you in November, December with panicked emails saying, please give me this data. And look, I, I'm the first person to say, if you're a junior company, you're probably going to be a relatively small part of 
portfolios. Okay, maybe not in Matt's portfolio, but for, 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 for most of the portfolio managers, it's probably a relative small part. So it's actually probably not going to move the needle much at the end of the day. So, but I, it's something you should be aware of because certainly if you can do it, I think you'll stand out relative to peers in being able to actually provide people this data. It's going to make your investors' lives easier. So I just wanted to mention that. Okay, great. Thanks, Joe. I could carry on asking you questions for ages, but I'll give the others a chance and then I'll come back to you to carry on. Um, Matt, um, I noted your point that um, you take different stakes in companies. Sometimes you the the only shareholder and sometimes you um, the largest, etc. And I wondered if the size of the stake that you take in the country country, company, influences um, what you expect, both when you screen and when you um, are a shareholder? Uh, look, you, to be, you know, <clears throat> short answer to that is yes. <clears throat> Once you become a substantial shareholder, which depending on the jurisdiction you're in, you, uh, you know, there are restrictions on your ability to buy and sell, um, and you make regulatory filings where our, our name is associated uh, with these companies. For us, it's not so much about the association. We have these conversations with all of our portfolio companies and all of our investee companies, but we feel like when we become a substantial shareholder and a named uh, regulatory shareholder, that, that, that kicks in a lot of work. And it's a lot of work to engage tightly with a company on things that, uh, that may not be their top priority. Um, and it, it, it's interesting. So, Joe, you know, just to just to come back, what you're talking about is exactly on point. And the conversations that we have with junior mining companies is, listen, you need to you need to understand the demands of uh, your investors and how they're changing and evolving, and what that means for you to be successful in courting other um, you know other investors. When you think about in a in a junior mining context, and by this I mean explorers, developers, emerging single asset producers. So we run a, we run a survey. In fact, we're just uh, finishing up our semi-annual survey right now, but, but for the last uh, uh, four quarters, we've run this survey where we go out and we look and we say, who's doing a good job of disclosure? And that's anything from a standalone sustainable sustainability report uh, through to, through to, you know, do you talk about sustainability? Do you talk about, um, uh, any kind of the metrics that we're interested in or the areas that we're interested in on your website, or you just, or do you say nothing at all? And what you'll find is that in the sub $500 million market cap uh, world, over time, that's been changed a little bit. Toronto markets and the London markets are more advanced than the Australian markets in terms of their patterns of disclosure. But there's still just a, a, a huge gap in terms of people that are interested in talking about ESG uh, to the investment community and presenting themselves in their, in their best light. So a lot of the times, Jane, what we're talking about is, is we're saying, look, you, you know, it could be daunting. There's a lot of these different regulations, but you need to pick a set. Here's the set that we like, um, but, but, uh, but why don't you start moving towards these goals and talking about publicly? And that's going to position you to attract the likes of you know, our tritrium or other people that that if you're if you're not uh, in a disclosure paradigm at all, you know, the, that's a that's a stopping point for them. So so at the very beginning, you know, when you're having that conversation, the larger uh, uh, your share ownership is, generally, the louder your voice is. What you find is that when you're engaging with people about around sensible topics like how do you present a more attractive investment profile. Generally, that's a, that's a really uh, good two-way dialogue, and people are interested, and they're they're confused, but they're interested to learn what am I supposed to be doing in order to show up and uh, and do the right thing. And yes, it's another thing that they need to be concerned about, and another part, uh, but uh, of what they need to do. So, adding to the tasks at the same time, it's an essential part. If you're in the hunt for capital, you have to provide what capital needs. <laughs> that's a good point. Um, the other thing I just wanted to ask you about, um, and it, it comes from a previous conversation, it just about companies thinking about their mineral products and um, the value of their mineral products 
Well, in, in supply chains, in value chains, um, you have some strong views about that, if you would like to comment on that for me. Um, in supply chains geared to decarbonization. Yeah, I mean, Joe's, uh, Joe, I found Joe's comments very interesting, but at the heart, one of the conversations we're having right now now with our portfolio companies is you need to understand how many people are making net zero commitments. And what that means is they're really pressing inside the entire mining value chain to see can the can miners eliminate their scope one and scope two emissions, which becomes somebody else's scope three emissions, because the levers are actually relatively uh, few. They take some intentionality and they're hard to work on. So we're, we're having this conversation all the time with, with our portfolio companies and with prospective uh, investee companies around how are you adding value, not just to your customer, but to your customer's customer. And, and that ultimately is the end user that wants to look back and say, hey, uh, right now the conversation is car uh, carbon. Soon it's going to be you know, human rights or water quality or another piece. And so we're saying, look, measure it, track it, uh, be able to apply it somehow to your commodity, but really think about the value that you add to your customers. Customers, what we have found is that that actually opens up, that level of thinking opens up a whole new category of people that are interested in your company and your end product from a strategic nature. So it's value enhancing as an investor, it's value enhancing as a company, can provide you alternate routes to capital, and it can provide you, uh, many of these companies are looking for offtake partners or strategic partners. If you're thinking about how can I help, you know, end, steel end user decarbonize or uh, uh, this person decarbonize or that person, you know, decarbonize. It's, it's, it's a very serious conversation, very topical right now. I would assume almost all the other panelists are having some measure of that thought process right now. Just before I move on, um, I, I, um, I want to ask, Carl, a question next, but I just want to go back to you, Joe, and just ask you about your, um, just on the subject of decarbonization, about this um, Trium, Trium Emissions Impact Fund. Um, would mining companies be included in that? Is, is that part of the vision or? Yes, uh, we own we own mining companies today. It's one of our uh, yeah. larger yeah. parts of the fund right now, I think. To Five's point, I think a lot of the companies have uh, really made great strides in terms of outlining their plans. And and my view is, you know, these we're, we're investing in equities. We're not investing in debts. So we're actually investing in the future. So I I really respect companies. And you know, I don't want to. We always tell companies, look, don't give me a 2050 took target. Give me like a 2025 target. Give me something that actually we can see that it's occurring with an actual capex line or something associated with it that we can actually track. Because I mean, I you know, I think people want to see action or at least immediate plans. Um, and I think where we see that, and certainly also to, I agree 100% with what Fife says, I mean, the mining industry is going to be essential in the decarbonization process of this planet. So you're going to have to have actually more <laughs> of a lot of these metals. And the only way to do that is to invest and put capital in those areas. So I, and, and I think there will be attractive returns doing that. So yes, I mean, to your question, yes, in both ways. Note your point, 2025, not even 2030, really, <laughs> really. A 2025, you're spot on, right? The, the places where you're getting up new angles. Um, the, about nine months ago, we were having a conversation with a major uh, uh, mine contractor that look, we really want um, low carbon trucks for some of our mining companies. They said, well, we're just, you know, we're not interested in providing that. And today, of course, that's ground zero. Everybody's working on whether it's hydrogen or mini LNG or CNG or whatever it is. There's, there's a lot of technology that's pushing there. And that means that the, the palette of options or the menu of options that are open for developers and emerging miners is never been greater in terms of their ability to access uh, thought process that can deliver into a 2025 goal. And what that means is that's actually, that's meaningful table stakes in terms of being involved in a strategic conversation. Really exciting, particularly when you think about how fast all of this has happened over the last, you know, 15 months versus where what it was like a the rate of change in the in the 15 months in front of that. And now I'm going to go in a different direction now. Um, I I'm going to ask, I know both Carl and Amanda 
have a particular interest in talking about the S and G of ESG. And I'm going to start with Carl. Um, um, your view uh, of minus meeting expectations on S and G. Sure. I mean, I guess I should start by saying since we are a, um, a US-based hedge fund, we don't have the same um, complexities potentially to our investment strategies. So we invest in equities and um, generally stay below 10%, uh, although we run a fairly concentrated portfolio. But because we focus on small mid caps um, and probably take a more traditional view to ESG, I mean, we spend a lot of time focusing on governance and sort of governance, what it means to me from our investor perspective is, is corporate governance as opposed to potentially, um, you know, how a mining company views governance in terms of, you know, is it their ethical business practices, et cetera. Um, for, you know, for us in terms of corporate governance, that is the best way to show us that, that you're aligned with us in terms of how you're implementing those strategies. Um, and there's a very broad, um, there's a big delta between sort of how good companies are doing it and how some uh, there's weaker, you know, actors in, in the space as well. So for us, we spent a lot of time looking looking at that um, because we think if you have good alignment with us, then it helps and it's certainly proven in terms of cost of capital, um, access to capital, et cetera. If you have good governance, it goes a long way. I'm gonna carry on the governance to Amanda. I just have to comment, stop and comment on governance, being a sustainability consultant and reading all the standards on governance and um, international guidelines like the International Resource Panel. I see governance as sort of governance towards sustainable development and, um, and to the Paris Agreement goals. And so it's um, alignment with standards, compliance with laws, management systems, um, and I, I agree that those standards don't talk about govern, uh, corporate governance. They sort of, it's almost complementary. And it's very interesting to hear you make that point, that very important point. And I'm also aware that uh, Amanda, I've, I've read some of your papers um, and you make the point that management, management, management is very important and that management relates to um, to the resource, to the mine, and to ESG. So uh, if you could just elaborate on your view about the corporate governance. Um, sure, I think it goes, let me start a little earlier in terms of how we do what we do. Um, so there are a million standards out there. There's the Aussie corporate governance code, the UK corporate governance code, the American one. Um, there's also, uh, you know, the global tailings dam standards. There's just a lot of standards out there that make ESG complicated. So um, we decided to kind of come up with our own that tests against all of them. And we invest at the development stage. So we are looking to sort of get these guys from resource into production because we think that's the rest, the best sort of risk reward adjusted section of, of the mining investment world. Um, and what we think is that ESG can actually provide more reward. So a company that rates higher on ESG, both in the corporate sense and in terms of their end product, we think will sell, will trade at a premium. Um, and in order to do that, we need to help these companies put in proper um, ESG metrics. And a lot of it, as Joe said, it is measurement. Um, when it comes to the S and the G, G is a lot about policies and it doesn't really matter which corporate governance code you're following as long as you follow it well, because <laughs> the corporate governance codes are pretty decent. Um, the IFC performance standards are, are excellent, um, but complex in terms of, of coming up to them. But increasingly, what we're trying to do is get mines to a place where they could qualify for something called IRMA. The International Raw Materials Association has put out sort of a sustainability passport, as it were. Daimler, Chrysler, and Ford have come back and said, um, if you want to put your metals into the parts in our cars going forward, you need to have, it needs to come out of an IRMA certified mine. And so we think it's pretty hard to greenwash a mine, to go back retroactively and fix it once it's been built. 
So the idea is to help them build it properly to begin with. And that includes things like lowering their carbon footprint, um, but also putting in all the corporate governance and policies that'll get them to where they need to be. And that includes things like ESG policies and, and, and zero emissions policies or net zero in the, in the short term. I mean, we're not waiting till 2030. <laughs> um, all of those things come into play. And my experience is the one thing you really need in, in our investments that we've done sort of to date is you need management buy-in. You don't like, you can have all the policies in the world, but unless management understands the importance of ESG now and going forward, you're not going to properly implement it because it starts at the corporate governance level and it has to flow through all the way to the guy who's sweeping you know, the mill floor in the long run. Um, and, and you need to have high standards at the top, but it needs to flow through the operations. It means that you, know, you do have to take care of biodiversity. You have to have a reclamation plan and it's complex and it's not easy, but that means you need to plan it very, very well in advance as well as you plan your, your environmental and social action plan needs to be planned as well as your feasibility study, in my personal opinion. And, and, then, and, and your corporate governance codes need to come up to the highest standards if you hope to be able to sell into the market with producing raw materials in the long run. I, I, I love that. <laughs> it's music to my ears. <laughs> um, um, I do want to ask a question about engagement, but I want to go back to Carl on um, the social side of things, meeting social expectations. And then I'm going to come back and talk about engagement to end off in general. Um, meeting your expectations, um, minds meeting expectations in terms of social aspects of ESG. Do you think they deliver the information that is needed to make decisions and inform about performance? I think it's important to sort of acknowledge that mines are scattered around the world. And so jurisdictional risk is different for many different assets and, and also where you, at what stage you're investing. So we'll make an investment in potentially a basically greenfield investment, um, sort of something that just has a resource on it and we're invested in giving them additional equity and helping them go to the development stage. And in our experience, if you mess up S at the very beginning, you've just pushed out your potential development timeline, potentially indefinitely. So for us, that that IRR all of a sudden is just dragged out, and and it doesn't, you know, it's, it becomes a poor investment. So for truly junior juniors, um, getting S right is really important, and it's not so much, you know, the disclosure of it's obviously important, and but getting it right and sort of doing those local community consultations, etc., and trying to figure out what drives that community and what the, what the government wants, et cetera, et cetera. Spending the time to do that properly, um, I think is very important. And I think it's something that a lot of companies want to rush, rush, rush to drill, 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 because they need money to, to move the project forward. And it often sort of can, I think the importance of it gets overlooked sometimes. And in terms of disclosure, I mean, I, I see some of the larger companies tell me, well, we have 83% buy-in um, at the community level. Well, that sounds like a good number, but if that, you know, if the other uh, other piece of that is standing and blockading your mind, that's not a great, you know, that's not all that useful to me. So I think, you know, I think the sustainability reports are going a long way to sort of to give examples of how they're, sort of what initiatives they're doing. So you can kind of put your hands around it, but all of us, I think, go to mines, and we're really fortunate to be able to do that and sort of put our hands on it and see it and experience it and get a comfort level in terms of how their each company is taking their approach to dealing with the, the government and local communities. Um, but I think better disclosure in terms of their philosophy and their strategy and their approach to it would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. I would also, I would follow on that if I could and say that's the issue in terms of disclosure. I mean, all of these companies have beautiful sustainability reports and they're really good at highlighting what they do well. What they're not good at is highlighting what they do badly. <laughs> um, and, and if we are privileged because we do get to go to Mindsight and we touch it and we feel it and, and that allows us to be specialist investors. But I think that one of the real issues is that 
the E in ESG um, is a bit easier to measure because either you know your your carbon score, your carbon place in the carbon curve is what it is. But how do you know if you genuinely interact well with the community? That's a much I think of all of the disclosures, social disclosures are are the hardest to measure, um, and and where and it's where where we're gonna have. I'm not sure. The truth is, if I'm being, I know how to do it myself when I go there, but in terms of just a regular reporting measure, I think it's a lot more difficult. Completely agree. Well, I, I, I would agree a lot with those last two comments. And the, the one thing I would say is, you know, it is very important to remember what we're talking about here, which is that, you know, the reality is that the there's such a focus across the entire investment world on data and try to basically classify rank or put things in some sort of factor model and back test or whatever to get to the answer. Um, but I think everyone on this panel and everyone probably watching knows that that doesn't really work for like small miners in terms of because there's no data or the, it, you know, the, the, the degree of variability of outcome is so big. So I do think that, um, you know, there's sort of a minimal level of data, but I think the, the what's incumbent, I think, on the management teams uh, to think about when they talk to investors, they, is they actually need to talk about those issues more than just put it put a number in the report and actually try to because not, I mean there are specialist investors who will visit these mines, but that unfortunately is a subsection of the capital that's out there. And yes, it may be a very profitable and attractive subsection to be in, but ultimately I think all these companies want to move into into uh, more institutionalized capital that doesn't have individual mine level expertise. And I think the way they have to do that is to be able to discuss you know kind of not what's in the sustainability report but almost why they do it or why they did what they did or how they came to that conclusion through the and that's a that's a bit of a more of a management communication discussion but i think if you can do that i think that would really pay off with investors i think another thing would that would be helpful for um companies is it, we we all, we all like data um, but often there's no disclosure in terms of how much money is being spent on x y and z i mean i think if you can't track, I mean, you're never going to compete with Newmont and Barrick in terms of how much money they spend on an absolute basis compared to, you know, a small cap. You're just not, it's an impossible equation. But I think being able to understand the philosophy and a management's philosophy to the S component is really helpful. And, and that I think you can talk to and they could, they could write out. I mean, it doesn't come down to, you know, we're spending, you know, $10 million a year and putting it into a local fund, et cetera. I mean, I think there's an actual philosophy and generally there's hot buns in most places. Water is generally something that people want to talk about. People want to talk about local development in terms of jobs and education. Um, so there's some certain key points that I think sort of if you were to take it up a high to a higher level, I mean, there's certain core topics that, that sort of resonate generally across the board. I would say, hmm. so we do, we try to encourage as much measurement as possible. And the truth is if we can get, the companies we invest in to score better on ESG, we'll try to do that. But what we found is, is it goes back to the G and the governance. And if they have a good policy, but you require them to report against it, like how much local procurement do they do? How many lost time injury? Like there, there are things you can do, but it hasn't been standardized yet. But I think increasingly you're gonna see ways where they have to have the right policies and then re report against their performance against those policies. I think, personally, I think that's where it's going. I see that we are coming up to time to close almost, and there are two questions that have been asked of us that um, I haven't uh, chased. So, um, well, one question I'd like to put forward to all of you, um, can you cite examples of juniors who've exceeded expectations? I'll start with Matt. Um, in, are you able to cite some examples right now? Uh, I mean, look, I would point towards our own portfolio quite selfishly. Um, <laughs> a little bit. Look, at, at the heart of the, at, at the, I was being very silent. I was listening very hard to what the other panelists were saying, because I think what you saw was a generalized frustration at the, uh, at, at how hard it is, right? And how many contributing factors there are. The way that we think about this, Jane, is we, is, is you come back to you, so you have to properly identify uh, what are the material risks, 
And one thing that's just flat out true is that interaction with uh, communities and, and stakeholders, broadly speaking, government interactions, indigenous interactions, local stakeholder interactions, that, that, you know, the enti that entire area generally represents material risk. So the question of how do you, how do you measure, how do you report? We run perception audits uh, uh, that are independent of management so that we can understand what's going on and is management, you know, either channelize their information, hearing what they want to hear out of the right people or, uh, you know, so we're running perception audits in communities we're run, and, and we're, sometimes we're out there getting uh, some of our, our own data. And that's usually when you're a more significant investor, you start to measure around the corners rather than being solely where you are. So there, there are different ways that you can go out and get that data, but uh, and some of that data is with your own two eyes, as, as people said, and, and what, you, what you see and feel. But at the core of this kind of disclosure element is, are you, are you talking about what, your material, what you think your material risks are? And then are you providing any context around how those might be uh, measured in the world and how you think you're doing against it? And, and there's, so there's kind of, there's two things that I'd like to uh, talk about in, in that. First is you can imagine uh, most people that are in mining love their jobs. They absolutely love them and they feel like they are doing uh, you know, good work in the best way possible. And so when you're interacting with them, uh, they're, you know, and it's also it's a difficult job. There's a lot of different things to contend with. So now there's more and more coming at them. One of the things that I'm pretty focused on is uh, as an investor, I'm actually quite happy to pay to provide a positive carrot as opposed to just it's all about exclusion and naming and shaming. So finding a correlation on the governance side between a sound policy and executive comp and board comp, who all of whom are handling a much bigger load than they were, and it's only increasing in terms of those needs and trying to drive towards some of these outcomes, you say, great, let's, you know, if I want this outcome, put a dollar sign on it. Okay, great. Now we are moving in the direction of a positive conversation, which is, I like what you're doing. Show me that you're doing it. And they say, well, I'm going to show you that I'm doing it because I get paid for it, right? So one of the things you can talk about is alignment with investors and compensation. That's something that not a lot of people are talking about right now, but I think is, is a worthwhile, uh, you know, conversation to have. And then I think the other, you know, effectively, that's probably one of the biggest pieces that's hanging out there for, for us is can you start to move through that compensation piece? And if you're asking people to do more, just get out of that blame game and get into the moving towards. So the final piece that I would la last with is that it is proper to set aggressive targets and measure towards them. And I can think of big companies and small companies that have done a fabulous job of saying, we want to end up here and moving towards them gradually. And you can't get it all in one bite. So there's lots of, you know, there's just so many little shining examples of somebody that has stood up in their community and really backed their stakeholders during COVID. Mining is absolutely replete with stories of people who have brought their uh, ability to deliver social infrastructure to the table during COVID. And there's a lot of silent, strong partnerships that are being built there. And that's just that's a, one, it's the right thing to do from a business concept, uh, construct. I'm, I'm, I'm basically forming better stakeholder relations. And it's also smart because your employees are there. They see it too. They see, hey, I'm, I'm showing up responsibly in this community and backing the community. So I think there's a number of those things uh, uh, that you can look at. Um, I know that that's not uh, portfolio company XYZ did ABC, but we usually don't comment on individual uh, topics like that. And, you know, we could talk, I think we could go on for a double session here, but I see that um, we've got very little time left, so we're going to have to wrap up. And I'm going to wrap up with the one more question that's asked, and to some extent you've answered it, um, Matt. Um, so it was following on um, Manda's point that she made, and that was, um, our, uh, has the um, management team's understanding of ESG improved over the last years? So I think I'm going to ask you to wrap up with that point. Um, uh, and I will start with Carl and then Amanda and then Matt, if you could just make the final point. Yeah. I think management's team's discussion around ESG has certainly improved. Um, I think we've all on this panel highlighted our our 
feelings about governance and the importance of governance. And the one thing that always surprises me a little bit is we talk about costs of ESG implementation, et cetera, et cetera, but having good corporate governance is free. It doesn't cost you anything. It's free. And it's the best way to improve your ESG score by having good governance. So it, to me, having an alignment is important for, I, you know, we were just talking about, you know, examples of companies that do things right. And I would point to Silvercrest. Um, it is a portfolio company for us. Um, you know, they zero from time zero to, to production is going to be five years. I mean, that's going to be a record for in the money precious metal space. Why? Because they had alignment and they had good governance and they have, they communicated that appropriately. Um, to me, that's just a good example of how you can do things appropriately and, and get it done right. Right. Thank you. So this, I think management. I think management gets it. I think no ESG is in every boardroom and every C-suite in the mining industry right now. The question is: Is it significant? Actual dedicate? Like, do they realize it's important? And they need to find a way to to implement it into their, their company and their operations, or are they just trying to figure out how they can you know check enough boxes to get by? There is a difference. Um, and, and that that comes to, as, as sort of significant investors, being able to talk to management and figure out how sincere they are um, and, and figure out how much they're willing, how much they're willing to work at it. And it does, uh, as Kyle said, it's all about having the right cover. You have to start with the right co corporate governance codes and, and you start at the top and you work your way down. But if they're not willing to agree to a lot of that stuff at the board level, that's a really huge indicator um, that they're not on board and they're probably not a company you want to invest in. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thanks, Amanda. And Matt, I'll leave you with a closing comment on that front. Look when I reflect back over the last four years, the, the, the rate and intensity uh, 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 volume of inquiries and discussions that we have with management companies on this topic is just, you know, the rate of increase is phenomenal. So the, so the, the prioritization of ESG and mining is, uh, from the largest companies down to the smallest is only increasing. And, and what you find is there is a trickle down effect in thought where what's happening over here uh, um, starts to set an example of where you need to aim when you're aspiring to become a producer. And now there are more examples out in the industry that you can point at and look at and say, uh, you know, you're not here today. You don't have the same business as, as this example, but you can move in this direction. So if the, the question is, um, our management team moving in that direction, it is just so clear to me that the answer is yes. And now the impatience that you hear from everyone else is, well, why aren't they there yet? Or how can we help them get there? Or how can we find more ways to discern as investors who we would like to uh, uh, put our trust in and um, and who and who we wouldn't, and that's an evolving field as well. So in general, uh, the level of dialogue and sophistication has changed remarkably. What I would say is that there's also still a long way to go in terms of uh, there are still a number of people that don't quite understand in this changing landscape how important it is to be able to demonstrate to people that that don't know you that you're taking care of your stakeholders and that you have a two-way relationship. Uh, or that you're managing your material risks and that you have a thoughtful process that you're following and are kicking those goals. And so rather than being um, shy or embarrassed about putting out imperfect information or things that are um, uh, might present a point of attack, there's also uh, this kind of uh, 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 growth and acknowledgement that's coming along, I see, where people are able to present the facts of what they're doing well and, and where, they, where they're trying to improve in a public forum and not get attacked for it. And that, that's, a, that's a piece that's happening right now as well. And so it's, it's very encouraging from my perspective. Great, thank you. That's an excellent closing point. Um, thank you to all the panelists uh, for taking part in this discussion. I've enjoyed it very much. Thank you, Minds and Money and um, the audience for listening in. 
I'll close out now. Bye, everybody. Thank you.